This is my conclusion video on how to design and build your own PCB pedal. In episode one, you learned how to reverse engineer a blues breaker circuit and design your own PCB. On the second video, you learned how to lay out the components on the PCB. And for this third video, we are gonna learn how to build this PCB in real time. So this is also a build video. So stick around and remember that there is a fast forward button in YouTube if you are starting to get bored and you wanna fast through, forward through things. All right, so now I'm gonna start unpacking some of this. Um, so on the components for soldering, right now we have the rectifier for protection, reverse polarity po protection. Um, I'm going to be in and out. This is going to be an interesting setup. I'm trying to always continuously improve my setup. And this time around, I'm using a really nice USB microphone into my camera, my phone. And then I also have my dual shot. So my photo over there, my video for two different shots, maybe even a picture in picture. Let's see how this goes. All right, so one of the other things is really, really hard to shoot these videos and talk, comment through them. Um, but I'm going to do the best that I can. All right, so that's reverse polarity protection. Next up, we have our clipping diodes. These are just standard 1N914s. Pretty much all the components in this build are very standard. Nothing ex exotic. What I mean by exotic um, is you're basically looking at I don't know, anything that falls under the general purpose category. And these are general purpose diodes. And let's see if I can find, um, the resistors are carbon film. If you want to go with the all original, if you want to go with like a little bit more upgraded, you want to go with metal film, uh, resistors. If you really want to get crazy, you can do, um, you can do silver mica capacitors. I'm trying to find my lead bending tool. Very messy right now. So I'm going to use my lead bending tool to get a crimp on these leads. Um, so it just kind of centers up the device that I'm inserting a little bit better. So let's see if I picked a good lead forming. So see how that kind of fits really nice in the middle. I'll show you on camera here. What I'm doing is I have the lead, the device in there. I'm going to just kind of push down, make sure it's centered, push the legs through on both sides, and then make sure, of course, I align the way the diode is supposed to go. Like that. Going to do that with two more. So while I'm building these, I'm, I'm going to start, I think, doing more projects that are a little bit like C series, a few things, like a few episodes long, really not making any sense in this video at all. I'm um, talking through. So for example, like I'm making a dumbbell later right now. Um, there's a lot of design that kind of went in the background. I did that silently without really talking about it. I mean, I've posted a few pictures on Instagram, but it's not at all like on YouTube. And weirdly, I love watching videos on YouTube of people trying to do something new and then kind of learning with them through the process. And why I just haven't done those types of videos myself is beyond me. Um, but I think I'm gonna start doing more of that. All right, so what do we got? We got MLCCs here. This one's 25 volt 0.1. I, 
I did order two projects in this Mauser order. So I'm hoping these are what I need. Yep. Pretty sure. Yep. Okay. So yes, 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 yes. So 0 0.01, 25 volts, MLCC. The original Blues Breaker axial capacitors are a, li a little bit of an unknown. There's been a few people that have tried to find them, and none of them were in that they did find were in the correct value. So the closest thing we have are these, or there's like polystyrene looking ones. See, I think I could just bend these. All right, so remember, these are 0 0.01, which is point, or sorry, 10 nanofarad. These are not polarized, so you don't have to worry about which way is plus, which way is negative. So the so MLCC, I'll do a little education. MLCC stands for multi-layered ceramic capacitor. And if you ever see those discs, um MLCs, oh not MLCCs, they're just ceramic discs. They're like single layered and they tend to drift. The MLCC construction has a big advantage of being a little bit more tire tolerance and smaller size. All right, so here is a 10 K ohm quarter watt carbon film resistor. Let's find it. All right, we're looking good. That's an LED. All right, looks like I got a lot of these ceramic capacitors. What did I get here? Again, I ordered for like two different projects, so. I think I was just auditioning different sizes. This is interesting. Look at this. It's very big. It's interesting. Hmm. I don't think they'll fit in that hole. So I'll just have to remind myself that the 100 volt version, maybe I don't use those. Give me one second here while I wrap this all up. Interesting. All right, next up, what do we got? What do we got? Oh, it's a switch. We're gonna need that for later. All right, what's up, what's up? Oh, it's a LED. I don't need that right now. All right, 47 picofarad capacitor. Now, I'm not gonna install this one um, just yet, but 47 pico, the silver mica is kind of 
I don't know. We'll call it the premium boutique style choice in the circuit. It's very much reminiscent of what Vemoram would do. In theory, it smooths out that sort of top end harshness, whatever that is. All right, so this is 4.7K. Let's move this along. See if I can get in a groove. All right, 4.7K, done. Get my floor organization. All right, what's next? Point one. So this is 100 nanofarad. I have seen one. And that's where this one is going to go. You can see that there's a lot of time that goes into just unpacking resistors and capacitors. So if you're working on an assembly line, this will go a lot quicker, obviously, because you just, you, you don't need the extra time opening the bag each time. It's when you do like one pedal at a time, or if you have a customer that, you know, you're on a pre-order basis, and you only get one order or something, that can kind of, you can go backwards financially. Um, you know, if that's your goal, if you enjoy building, you enjoy building, but you know, I've had my feet in both sides of that, um, of the waters and, you know, sometimes when you're not making money, it's not fun. So now I'm looking to just kind of revert and do what I started off doing, which is just enjoying building things. Um, and now I'm using a 220k ohm resistor to build things, this thing, and do some cool designs, do something that someone else hasn't done. There's a million blues breakers on the market, so it's kind of hypocritical while I build this to say it's something that hasn't been done. Okay, looking good. Moving along. All right, I'm going to see, before I use a box film capacitor, what I mean by box film, uh, it's one of these guys. Before I throw one of those down, I'm going to see what else I bought here. Let's try to find resistors. Stick with that one thing. Here's a 33K. So this is one of the resistors that we're going to be toggling between uh, when it comes to the Make 1 V1 and the Make 1 V2. Um, I know that I've kind of mentioned this before. I've never really found a real-life example of a Make 1 V2. I don't know where in the internet world that popped up for the first time. I know I've seen it, and it somehow caught on as, as the one to model all the clones after. I 
Again, I'm just not quite sure why. I think it's a good time now to just start soldering and cutting some of the leads. Uh, we're about, I don't know, halfway through populating this board. It's pretty quick, right? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to grab my soldering iron. I'm going to clean off the tip here. I'm going to grab my favorite solder. Whoa. Not sponsored by them at all. I just love this stuff. Um, I'm putting all of that in the description too, by the way. So if you're watching this video, click on the description and you should see some of these things. I'm just going to go ahead and solder um, all these things in a big rip. This is a good time to let everyone know that there is a fast forward button in YouTube video. Just go in the settings and then playback settings and you will see the playback speed. Okay, now it's time to clip. And the main reason why I like that solder is it's um, quad eutectic, which means um, basically all the metals combined. No one really knows why, all the science community doesn't know why, but it does lower the melting point um, of the, the solder, which is cool. Um, I just picked up these 
Oh, so let me complete that thought. So lowering the temperature of the solder and plus the way that it has silver and stuff like that, it's great. It's audio quality or whatever that means. I think it's because the silver um, is a better conductor. So the higher frequencies aren't affected as much. But again, we're talking about audio frequencies. So the capacitance of the, uh, of the tin the solder really isn't going to make too big of a difference. Some people say it does. I don't know. I think it's a boutique myth legend sort of realm of things. Um, I like these snips. I'll put them in my description below. Uh, these are great because when you clip a lead, the leads don't go flying because there's this little thing on the top that kind of holds it from flying everywhere and you can have more control. So I can do this one-handed and not have to worry about the leads flying. Let's try it one-handed. It's my trick. And plus it's cool because they're flush. Just be careful not to nick your circuit board because if you break a trace, guess what? You broke a trace and you got to fix it. Not a bad learning thing, but if you can avoid it. So I'm going to try to like go a little bit at an angle on the back side here. It's smooth so that I have less of a chance of nicking it. You know what? I've had a few questions about why do I say Tom was right? Aliens bleeping exist. Um, basically, it's referring to how many, 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 many years, for many, 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 many years, Tom DeLong from Blink-182 has been claiming that aliens are real. We can always reference uh, Project Blue Book, which I believe was in the 50s, started in the 50s, uh, U.S. government looking into aliens, basically, the unexplainable. Um, the original X-Files, as some people say it. So fast forward to the 90s, Blink-22 was super popular. Um, Tom was always big into aliens, which is kind of cool. Then it became like kind of a cultural revolution uh, with ancient aliens later on. Um, whistleblowers, let's see what else can I throw in there. And most recently, um, where the Tom was right, thing came up where government officials, uh, whistleblowers came forward and was talking about uh, biological extraterrestrial entities, aka aliens, and how they are real. So that was from a government official. Um, I don't know why it's not bigger news than it is, it's kind of funny, um, but it became basically validation that Tom was right. And the logo is inspired here by to the Stars Academy. All big things that I'm a fan of. Anyway, slight diversion. Hopefully, hopefully the algorithm doesn't punish me for such nonsense. All right. Um, 3.3K. Let's do it. All right, next up, Tempico Farad. Yes. All right, so this is more or less in line. MLCC, Tempico Farad. Does it sound better? I don't know. I'm going to make two of these, I think. One with the ultimate boutique part selection. 
and then just one basically the way that the original was the same like sort of build um build i don't know ethos or just really probably the cheapest parts that were available at the time because there's something to be said about that All right, what's next? All right, so here's my 220 in that same sort of yellow casing. Okay, what else we got? Oh, here's my mill max. Okay, so this is these are fun to solder. They're basically um eight pin uh well they're mill max, which is kind of the brand, but they're eight pin sockets for ICs. Highly recommend these, although there was a time where I didn't like them because I had an issue with one, but now I'm kind of back to the idea of buying good quality um, sockets. So soldering these can be a little tricky and I'm gonna just go ahead and just tack this one in place. Um, just be careful with your finger and don't leave it on there too long and you'll be all right. But, um, or one of the other things you can do, maybe I'll do that. I'll kind of demonstrate a more proper technique. Um, grab some needle nose pliers. I'm gonna grab some lighter nose needle nose pliers. I'm gonna bend one of the legs. Actually, two of the legs on opposite corners. So now you're going to notice that it doesn't fall out when I tip it upside down, which which is good. And I don't need to solder it right now, but that's held in place. You can see there's a little notch at the top, and that should match the notch at the top on the silk screen. I don't know why there's such a big bag for 2.2 mega ohms, but there is... And there's only one of them. One of the things I ask myself is, I, I get a lot of plastic. So what the heck do I do with all this plastic? And if you are have ever ordered from me, you might have received a circuit board in one of my discarded plastic bags. It has to protect the circuit boards, the PCBs, um, and I can reuse it and feel good about myself reusing plastic instead of just throwing it out. Um, Mauser uses a lot of plastic. And I think it's just part of, part of the industry. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to slow down the impact on that. And if you notice, I started using cardboard, um, basically envelopes of sorts and packaging material. So it can break down, break down like me watching Monday Night Football last night. It's pretty awful. Anyway, I'm not much of a sports guy. That was a really big stretch. But I do have a 1K. And I'm going to install that 1K where a 1K is supposed to go. Let's grab 
my nifty little lead bender. Normally for prototypes, I don't make it so pretty, but now I've discovered that if I don't shoot a video, one of the first times I do a pedal or make a pedal, uh, there's a chance I'm not going to make it at all. So this helps me stay accountable for kind of what I'm trying to do on this YouTube page. All right, here's the other 10 pico farad um, mica capacitor. Um, again, that will be for like my, my uh, quote upgrade boutique version. Here's the 57 pico farad. Now, there's there are different quality grades of MLCCs. You might have not known this. Um, X7R, I think, um, is most common because it's pretty good for audio stuff. Some people can tell the difference in the quality of the construction and the sound of the quality of the construction um, and basically the dielectric temperature stability. And C0G and NPO or NP0 are the most stable and linear throughout the temperature curve. So if you're on stage and your guitar is, or your pedal board is exposed to the sun and your uh, pedal is black, well, guess what? That's going to be very hot. And that it might be a scenario where a lot of people talk about their fuzz faces needing to warm up. Um, guess what? That temperature dielectric stability is the reason for that. And it's getting into basically a capacitance um, that makes a difference in the sound. And it's basically a, a curve. So if you have a fuzz face that sounds good at certain temperatures, you should measure what that um, capacitance is at that specific temperature and then grab a higher quality or, or less affected by temperature change capacitor and replace it with something super close and see if maybe you're, you're getting cold, <laughs> good cold results with your warm results. So... Um, that's something that not a lot of people think about. I'm really enjoying the way that this design is looking at the moment. Pretty clean. Seems to make sense. If something makes sense while standing still and doesn't need a lot of explanation or just feels good looking at it, I don't know. I feel like that does make a difference. I'm very much into the scientific thing, but also... Um, some things, if they feel right, they feel right. And I think that's what music is all about. And that's what the 6.8K is all about. Quarter watt. And by the way, if I was to do a pedal run, I would have a crap ton more of these resistors in a bag. But I sacrificed this order and went very expensive to illustrate um what this would be like if you're just building this for yourself
All right, two more resistors to go. Oh, man, I pulled out an ML or a box film. All right, found one, 27K. It's one of you. Just get you where you belong. All right, only a few more components left. I found the 47K and and a switch. Let's get that switch for later. And Oh, and also I found the op amp, which is important. All right, 47K, here we go. There's two of them. There's a bag inside of a bag. Lots of plastic. All right, there we go. Um, I'm going to decide I'm going to solder off camera and clip these leads off camera um, just to cut down on the amount of time. And plus, that's not very much valuable information. And plus, I'll probably just ramble on and on. So here we go. Um, be right back. All right, here's another thing that I've done on this circuit board is I've added the a capacitor that can be used um that's not part of the original circuit basically but it could smooth out the the ripple uh the present ripple on your power supply um so i'm going to call this one optional since we're going with all original sort of vibes on this build not going for anything like sort of optimized at all I'm going to just install the one capacitor and it's not a crazy capacitor. And what I mean by that, it's not a crazy spec capacitor. Oh, where the heck is it? Um, meaning that it's not like solid polymer. You might hear me talk about solid pol polymer capacitors where it's super low ESR. And if you know anything, um, about circuits, ESR basically um, is equivalent series resistance. And the higher the ESR, the less perfect of a capacitor that is. So what I did was I really like these electrolytic capacitors, which have a little bit higher ESR and they are more true to the original um, sort of spec where they're wet electrolytic, so inside there's like some wet stuff. And these are Panasonic, so they're great quality electrolytics. And we're gonna install that here. And one of the design principles that I use in my builds um, or designs is all, you might notice that all the diodes, at least I try to, have all the diodes point a particular way, and then the same with the capacitors. So I try to get all the capacitors to point a single uniform direction. And what that's going to do is um, quickly spot errors uh, because capacitors and diodes are very important to a circuit. And if it's flipped, you either uh, these things go, you know, kaboom, they let out the magic smoke or they just don't work at all.
Okay. So um, let me just clip these leads. So basically I have an extra capacitor. I'm going to leave it off for now. Maybe I'll install it for the next one. I did come across this very interesting uh, on Facebook, this group, this spirited group talking about morning glory. And this gentleman was arguing that you should not install that capacitor and all, all sorts of LT spice circuit analysis and things like that. So he, he was very much into not installing that uh, for tonal reasons. And I'm not quite sure I understand that, but um, you know, I'll, uh, if I can find it again, I'll link it in the description and let me know what you think of it. Okay. Now that we have the, um, capacitor in, we're going to go ahead and start populating the wires. They're going to go to and from the uh, foot switch. So I'm going to just pop this off. There's little spring clips on this PCB holder. Again, I'll have one of these in the description below where to buy this. Um, I use them with most of my pedal builds, especially ones that are on camera. I'm just going to do a little quick cleanup here as well. So I did cut the bottoms, uh, double checked my solder joints and yeah. All right. So I really like stompboxparts.com, not sponsored by them, but they have, if I can find them, they have pre-cut wire, which is pretty awesome. And they come in various sizes. Like here's uh, six inch, which I'm going to be using from the jacks to the foot switch. And then they also have four and a half. Again, I'm not sponsored by them. Four and a half, I use these sometimes. Um, but I mainly use two and a half, I believe. There's two and a quarter or two and a half, which I cannot find any of. So give me a second. All right, here they are. They are two and a, two and a quarter inch and I use these um a lot so I buy them in bulk but they come in 120 pieces I think it's like six bucks again stompboxsupply.com not sponsored by them it's just you know if you have a good company I don't think you really you know need to be having sponsors or going out and finding folks um speaking on your behalf And this is one of the companies that I like to support. So what we're going to do is, I, you notice I took them out of the PCB holder. Um, I'm going to take the power and ground, wire them underneath. I think it looks a little cleaner. Um, and then I just kind of put the circuit board on the table like that. And it allows me to solder the top and it kind of gives like a little angle to the wire. You'll notice that the ground seems to take a little bit longer than the nine volt. And that's because the ground is connected to a, a whole copper plane, which is grounded. So this, you know, solid, you can kind of see here, there you see the tracks and then on the outside of the tracks is is shiny a little bit and the way that i've designed it is that is copper it's a copper pour i guess copper ground plane a bunch of things like that but copper acts as a good heat sink so the heat that you apply and again you want to have a little bit of solder come through the bottom uh if you're a person who solders for nasa you're going to say that i've used a lot too much solder um because every little weight counts when you solder for nasa i'm not a person who has soldered for nasa but on on youtube actually you can watch videos on how to solder for nasa and it is it is very eye-opening um if i find it again i will link it in the description um it shouldn't be that hard to find so what I like to do for the top, uh, or far, sorry, the foot switches is I will 
solder the foot switches wires to the top of the PCB. I think I might be able to get all four in there. Seems pretty tight. And that's just for making it a little bit easier to wire to the switch. The foot switch, that is. And I don't have one right now, but I will have a wiring diagram included in the documentation for this pedal. So I'm just going to kind of get them all to have some sort of uh, pressure to the table. It acts like helping hands. You can see here, I don't really have too much extra wire on the top exposed. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. This is what we have here. Now, next up, I'm going to be drilling the enclosure. So, a couple things um, I recommend. Here, I'll move this to the side. Here's our blank enclosure. Here is my faceplate. What's great about using faceplates is you get to cover some mistakes, kind of like, you know, you ever look at your wall outlet. Um, you know, there's a plate, and then behind that plate, when you plug in your, your 110 or 240 or whatever your region power is, that behind that plate is usually a pretty ugly hole. And you find that construction technique um, in a lot of places where there's plates or some sort of grommet to make things pretty. I have this blue book. Um, basically, it's a, it's a drill template. So you could drill it out by hand. The idea is that you print this out one for one scale. And if I found my ruler, I would show you that the one for one scale lines up with a ruler so you know and you can have some confidence that you are oh, here it is that you are measuring or sorry that you printed this out in one for one scale so what i do is i download adobe acrobat the pdf reader the one that you probably used for work or you've seen it on your own and there is when you hit the print button there's an option for you know no scale basically or there's some options like fit to page, you know, stretch to page, um, things like that. So there's one also an option for no scale. And that's how you want to print these out. And you can double check with these rulers. For uh, my friends who use centimeters for their measurement, here's a ruler for that as well. What I'm going to do, probably off camera, is cut cut this out you want to basically cut out uh along the edge here and we're going to use that to tape over the enclosure and we're going to use this and i love this tool it was like probably the best 30 dollars that i've ever spent you basically keep press pressuring press pressing brown and then eventually this thing will just make a perfect punch like a guide punch for your drill bit um, I was I was using kind of the, the clunky method of taking a hammer and then hammering, um, you know, basically a whole a punch, and I was not getting very accurate results. But with this thing, I get very accurate results. So I'm gonna go cut this out off camera, and I'll be right back. All right, so I did some uh, arts and crafts. I cut this out. I grabbed some scotch tape. So. After you cut it out, I fold it along the, the lines there, the black lines. And then what it should do is pretty much just be a really snug fit against, against your enclosure. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> so um, you can see here that when you fold it over, the edges should basically be at the, the edge of the enclosure here. So they ride along the lines on the bottom of it. Um, yeah, and you want to basically try to square it up as best you can. Obviously, it's not 100% perfect. 
uh, because, you know, you're not a CNC machine. You are human. Uh, or at least some of you guys are human. If you're not human, leave a comment below. But we're going to tape this down. And I'm going to do that a little bit off camera. So I'm just going to try to, try to, oh, too big. Try to secure this thing down as best as I can. So I'm going to tape over the enclosure like this. Not like that, but like this. A little further down. Um, and then fold it over like so. So it goes in the enclosure. I'm going to do that around all four corners. All right, I'm back from drilling. Here we go. Um, make sure you put down a towel or something, especially if you're on like a hard surface, because you don't know what is lurking underneath and you can scratch your finish because like, check this out. It looks pretty good right now. And you don't really want to scratch it. I've done it. It breaks my heart every time I look at that particular pedal uh, that I scratched because I was rushing um, and that's not good. I am using one of these LED holder thingies, diffusers. Um, they're, I don't know. I had one, a bunch of stuff lying around from pedal runs that I'm just going to start using. Um, one of the things that you're going to find sometimes when you buy pots is these little tips on the end. And that's basically alignment holes or, or four alignment holes. Um, you want to discard them take them off because they're going to not, they're going to make your pot not lay flush against the enclosure. One thing you're going to notice is that you're going to have a hard time potentially finding uh, 22K linear resist, uh, potentiometers. Wow. Pots. Um, this is, again, this is just a prototype to verify my build. So I'm going to use a 20K uh, w that I got from a tube screamer. It's not going to be the same sweep, but it's going to effectively have the uh, similar resistance, 22k b uh, linear. That's what the b stands for. And um, another thing on that is that I did find 22k uh, pots in this fashion with the right angle and everything uh, in the UK on eBay. So. Um, now that I started my camera up for the second half. So I did find those, those potentiometers on eBay for 22 K, uh, from the UK. I'm going to guess that that was related to maybe Marshall, um, ordering a bunch for their pedals. So you can find them. You can get away with 25 K and you can get away with 20 K. Um, but you ideally want to get the 22 K if you're going to go for a perfect build, right? All right, so the next thing I like to do, and this is kind of, I don't know why more people don't do this, but I guess it only matters when you have certain, you know, perfected drilled enclosures that are symmetrical. Now, I make a pedal that's not symmetrical on purpose, and then therefore this trick does not work. Um, so I'm going to just undo the hardware here. And again, double check that you have the 22K in the middle, uh, your A100s on the outside. For some reason, um, along the way, the pedal reverse engineers or so-called reverse engineers of pedals found uh, a linear 100K. And I'm not sure where they got that from. It's just, again, a lot of bad information being circulated about blues breakers. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and do it like this. So I'm going to start off like this. Again, make sure you have your 22K in here. It's a little tricky getting it aligned the first time. And then I'm going to sort of go like that and then lay it down. One thing to just to be careful of, and maybe you could prop it up in the end, is, you know, I'm just going to take my little thing here. It seems to be about the right height, close enough. 
I'm just trying to get these flush and make sure they're square. Actually, that's not very good at all. But what we're aiming to do, and I can tell you why we're doing this, is that it just makes aligning a little bit easier in the end. So I'm not going to tack them all right now. I'm just going to take the center, tack that in. You do not, you know, do a final glob of solder. Just do the bare minimum just to hold it in place. Oh, no. Because what we're aiming for is to do the install um, and not have them kind of flop around or fall out or anything like that. So now you can double check your work, make sure you have that stuff. But I'm going to actually set it to the side right now because the first thing we do when we're assemb assembling this enclosure is the power adapter and make sure the long leg is on the right. The long leg is for the nine volt. So there are different power connectors, power adapters, whatever power, DC power jacks. Um, with these, Tata sells them. I'm not crazy about those. They're they're good, but I've had a few fail. Um, so what I do prefer, if you are going to go with that size, I think the brand is called Lumberg, and they make uh, th same footprint, like the same size as this, but it seems to be a lot higher quality, and that's what this one is. And the way I could tell is that there's sort of like a brushed look on the top here. It's not extremely shiny like the ones I get from Tata. Afterwards, I do like to um, take either hot glue, ideally hot glue, or I'll use super glue and then, you know, spray it to hold that nut in place. One of the things you're also going to notice when we set this down is that that front pot sometimes will be in the way of the jack. So like this is kind of close. But it's it's not touching, obviously. Oh, let me let me show you this real quick too. So I like to bend the leg. It's what I'm going with that, the positive leg. So this, I guess this one would work. It looks like it would not interfere too much. It's it's close, but it shouldn't be too bad. Well, actually, let's see. Once I lock that down, it's going to be in that position. Yeah, that's that's a little close. It does look like you might have to bend the leads. So that small power jack here is probably preferred. All right. So we got actually got to rip this out. We got to do a few more things. If you look here, the LED has, on, at least on my footprint, it's a little, come on, focus, flat side. That corresponds to the flat side of your LED. Where is it? Which is usually the shorter leg. Yep, there it is. So the shorter leg goes into the um, side with a flat edge. And also there's a little flat edge on the LED itself here. And then I'm just going to go ahead and just bend these off to the side so they don't go away. Uh, so you can see how it will assemble. It's going to drop right in here. Um, and then what I do is I take a dentist tool or like a toothpick like that and then push it all the way if I'm using one of these diffusers. If I'm not using a diffuser and I'm just poking the LED through, uh, you just want to adjust your height and then solder it in place in the end. But for now, again, I'm not doing the final assembly just yet, I have to put the switches on. So I'm going to go ahead, find my switches. I love these. Um, what do I go with this time? NKK or mountain switches? They're both great. Uh, I think these are mountain switches. Oh, no, NKKs. All right, so I got that, got this. Let me just make sure I didn't 
of another brand or something. All right. So we're going to open these up again. Lots and lots of plastic. There's even three staples on this bag. Probably won't be able to reuse it. All right, so here is all disassembled. Again, this goes a lot faster when you buy <laughs> in bulk and you're building in bulk. Kind of go ahead and Whoops. Here's where things start falling apart when it comes to cleanliness and everything. Because I'm so excited to get to the end and test this prototype out, as I'm sure you guys are too. Okay. Here's something very important. Pay attention to how I sandwich this hardware together. First thing I'm going to do is not lose everything. Where'd it go? Please just be underneath. Okay. Yeah. First thing I'm going to do, oh no, I dropped it in there, is add a nut. And what this does when you add the nut is that you're pressing when you when you lock it down up from the top, you're actually going to be pulling against the threads. You do not want to be pushing against the body because that body and these threads are actually just pressed fit together. And if you start um you know, securing down your like the final pull or sorry ah, the final assembly at the top you could run the risk of separating the body from the threads and then that makes not good things happen all right secondly you're going to notice that i put the lock washer down next or the, the tooth and then what i like to do is i like to find the keyhole so there's a keyhole and place that down like so just gonna place that like facing down. You see it here. It's facing down. Uh, I'm gonna leave that extra hardware off to the side. Gonna open up the other switch. The footprint we used are good for uh, PCB pins as well as solder pins. So sometimes it's easier to find one type of switch. Uh, type over the other so like this is a solder connection you can see from the hole it's good for like wires you could put wire through it i do not use these these are the ones with the little lock washer on the top um i just don't so again following the same procedure i'm gonna first put down the wash or uh, the the nut And these are both long bat. I thought I got short bat, but oh well. At least they're both uh, the same, I guess. Long bat meaning you can see here that the switch, the bat, so to say, it looks like a bat for a baseball, goes really far. Add that here. All right, now comes the fun part of getting it all to marry up. Shouldn't be too bad. Just make sure you're not pushing out with your finger by accident on the bottom half. Before you forget, find your 
top plate. <laughs> Put that down. And then start using your hardware to put put that in place so they don't fall out. Sometimes your um, the nuts will be smoother on one side and kind of flat on the other. I recommend putting the flat side down and the smoother side up because that means that if your um, knob catches, it's not going to be a full catch. It's going to kind of slide over because when you rotate it, it will kind of hit the, the smooth parts, not the hard, rigid, jagged part. What's great is having nut drivers don't go crazy tightening it down um, so I just take this hardware and do it by hand because that sort of prevents me from really cranking down on it all right so you kind of get the gist I'm going to do that all off camera here my back's starting to hurt from standing in this weird position and I'm going to find that other <laughs> the other nut in the making all right, so now I'm to the point, so I just did the top here, and you notice that it kind of feels like there's a lot of pressure on the circuit board, so I can't really, I, I'm not going to tighten these down just yet. What I am going to do is very carefully go through, grab, my, grab, grab your soldering iron, and then this is what I was going to do eventually, even if I didn't have that problem before, is so I'm just going to very gently push down on the circuit board, and you can hear these pop. And what that's basically doing, and this is why I do it, is that we are reseeding the solder joints onto these pots. The big thing that you are, are doing here is that you're preventing the, the legs when you tighten the top down, the body down. You're preventing the legs from warping the wafer disc, the actual resistance of the pot. And that's bad because then you'll get these weird sort of things where if you turn your volume knob, you might hear it go woof, woof, woof. You hear that woofing? Um, that's basically the wafer not getting a great contact. Uh, you can get oscillation. You can get all sorts of bad things. So I'm just going to go, again, just pushing down gently, trying to get that symmetrical. If you can do uh, do the frustrating method of not soldering anything, and then just trying to get that circuit board to kind of fall into place with all those the hardware, that would be ideal. But, you know, I'm just trying to give you some ideas. It's not the straightest. And that might actually be because of the body. Actually, that's why. So you're going to notice that there's a little bit of an angle. And that's the difference between the PCB pins. Actually, no, sorry. It's not the PCB pins. It's it's the body of the switch itself. Um, one is a little longer than the other. So it's kind of cocking that a little bit. And then you can see the size of the switches are a little, little different. Not too bad. Um, still okay. Again, you don't, don't want to go too crazy. All right, now I'm going to do a test. Just going to rotate these. Listen to make sure that the pot is not warped or the wafer disc is not warped where that wiper blade 
is not touching at any point, but it seems to be pretty consistent resistance all the way across the sweep. So I think that that's okay. All right, so at this point, I'm just gonna double check things. And additionally, I'm gonna actually take my little toothpick here or a dentist tool and then push that LED down into the cavity of that LED diffuser and it should click. Yeah, there it goes. Sometimes it, it may not, but I got a good click and then the surface here is nice and flush. So that's good. I don't actually know what color that LED is. So one thing when I'm soldering switches, I do like to go back and forth if I have two switches or give, you know, one of the switches time to cool. Um, because the body can actually get so warm that it will kind of def deform and your switch mechanics don't work very well. And sometimes what I do is I like to actually toggle the switches while I'm soldering them. Not like while I'm soldering them, but shortly after I soldered them, just to to make sure that there's no, you know, warpage, I guess. And then if I am going to hit the same one a few, you know, I'll give it a few minutes or seconds before I move on. That's one of the other nice things about using this particular solder is that it's lower temperature than my other solder I used to use, like the 6040 lead the Keister 6040, the stuff that everyone else uses. Um, that requires higher temperature to melt. All right, so I did get a warning that my phone is overheating. So at this point, what I'm going to do is cut the leads or clip the leads. I'll do that here. Uh, have some breakfast because it is four or five something in the morning. And then I'll be back to finish this up and we get to hear if we did a good job building this thing from scratch. All right, this is when things get really fun. Like I'm circling the final bits of this pedal. Um, this is one of my favorite, actually my very first build was a blues breaker. So I'm excited that this is a project that I am going for. All right, so next up, I'm going to just get the foot switch going here. Um, show you something that I do. So again, we can use this as a temp, as a little holding jig. I'm going to use the keyhole, face that downward. And I'm going to make this... Uh, True bypass. Let me just do it. The original was not really true bypass. It just toggled the output um, between the effect and the bypass, I guess, which was just tying in the, the input to the output. But it always had the input uh, going into the pedal. So some people don't see that as a true bypass. And what I'm looking for now is my resistors. I have a bunch 
of zero ohm resistors. There they are. So these are zero ohm resistors. I get them from Tata in a lot quantity. Um, zero ohm, uh, there, there's just basically a conductor. And you can you can use like a clipped lead to do what I'm about to do. Um, but you don't have to. You can use one of these. And the reason why I like to use these is just a little cleaner. And it's not really that important. So I personally like to thread all through each of the other little slots there. I'm going to leave a little space just in case I want to um, ground the input in bypass mode, which some people um, like that approach of bypass wiring to uh, basically just ground the input to the pedal. So when you're not using it, the signal is being grounded and some people say that that will be quieter quieter in what sense I don't know because sometimes you can get weird things on like the power when you have um, pedals that are they're on. Sometimes the noise can feed back into the power supply. Uh, I don't think I've ever really had that happen. Or there could just be a noise resonating on there, getting bleeding into the signal um, of the wires going into the pedal itself, like physically through the pedal. You know, with some crosstalk. Again, I don't know if I've ever seen that. I'm not going to be grounding that input just yet because I can always um, just connect <laughs> the input of the pedal to the input of the 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 source, the signal source, and mimic the original wiring. So you can see that it's way easier to do this out of the pedal. Um, and the reason why I would mimic the original wiring, because we are making this pedal uh, original of sorts. Or at least the potential is to have it 100% original, but in a real more robust case, way more robust um, switching. And plus replaceable parts. I've already had someone reach out to me. It says they busted their foot switch on the reissue. So um, just like the original, I guess, we're going to have issues. All right. So the input wiring, I'm not going to do just yet. I'm going to grab a six inch pre-cut lead. Come on, where are you? I'm going to feed that through. Just basically taking off the, the little shield. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of route it um, through the pedal out to the side. You can see here just on the bottom. I don't know. This is just kind of an aesthetics that I sort of like when it comes to these. And then I'll just kind of feed it up as best as I can. I'm going to kind of reach down and do the same on the input side. I know it's kind of confusing sometimes. Everything's sort of backwards when it's upside down. All right, so for now, since I'm doing this true bypass, I'm going to find my needle nose here. Got a little bit of a messy situation going on. I was going to bend the wire forward. 
speed that up through. I personally like to twist it around to give a good solid mechanical connection. Um, one of the, uh, I think it was the Air Force training videos that was released on YouTube. They talk about, and I, and I love watching those old videos. There's such character in them. Um, basically, the joints, all joints should have a solid mechanical connection. There is no reason for, basically the, the thought is that you should not have to use solder. Um, it's there for security and bonding, of course, in high vibration sort of environments. But the first joint should, in theory, be so tight and good and conductive that it doesn't need solder. Um so you're not, you know, filling any air gaps or anything like that. You want to have a good solid mechanical connection before you add solder to it. And the solder just holds it in place is sort of their theory. Let's talk a little bit about foot switches uh, for a second. Not all foot switches are equal. This is a low force um, Stompbox Pro or uh, Stompbox Parts Pro. Um, and what they've done is that this is actually high temperature uh, epoxy on the foot switch itself, so it can take some heat for you know any sort of wave soldering irons and things like that. So. I like these switches. They're low force. Again, if you get like an alpha pot, you go like those are, or uh, sorry, alpha stomp switches. Those go clunk, 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 very heavy. Um, I've come to really like and appreciate the lighter force switches and plus these have never failed on me to date. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. Could be a little bit of the high temperature epoxy. Um, I'm not too crazy about the standard foot switches that I get from Tata the non-alpha brand. Um, they're kind of like bluish. Those are weird. You cannot use these. They're very expensive. These are, it's, it's a Lili. Uh, it's just a momentary switch. Those are for a whole different ap application. The Gorva switches are really good. So shout out to Gorva. The, these and Gorva feel exactly the same as far as like the click force. All right, so let's just keep down here. I am going to kind of weave the front uh, where it says in over to the in here and do the same sort of folding over mechanical connection bond thingy. Gonna do the same with the out. And you could kind of do what you want as far as wire management to, to make these as nice or whatever as you'd like. I kind of just push them off to the side. I don't know. Maybe I'll loop it back up towards the front. Maybe I'll just leave it towards the back. Um, and the reason for that is I just don't want these wires to get crosstalk and, you know, pick up something in the, in the circuit. And that does happen. Um, that happened to me with the, aqua pus boards or pus aqua pus boards or my low mark basically all it was luckily was a simple you know how far i placed the wires close to the clock 
um, for the MN3005 chip, the delayed chip, that is within the audible range. So with uh, when you put a wire close to that area of the, of the circuit board, it does pick up that audible uh, clock noise, which isn't good. So I'm just going to kind of weave this up and back and around up to the front. The ground is going to go in the center here. And one of the reasons for that is if you do the wiring method where you ground the input, you need that ground uh, when, the, when you ground the input when the pedal is in bypass mode. You need the ground to be right here. So the connection is jumpered. Right now, again, I'm not doing that jumpered connection to ground yet. Um, you know, as I re evolve the circuit, I kind of wanted to go close to the original as I can with this one. Okay, let's tack these in place. Okay, so very simply, if I wanted to go back and forth between the very, very original, which is just selecting the output. Um, all I have to do is simply put a jumper, a wire between the input and that middle, input to the pedal and the input from the jack. Just a little jumper there with a with a lead. You can take a discarded lead from an LED or whatever, uh, or one of your capacitors. Those are pretty long. And that will basically always have the input connected to the pedal, to the actual circuit. Um, does it drag down the, the source signal? I don't know. All right, next up, wherever it is, I'm going to be using these. I buy them from Amazon in bulk because I build pedals a lot and guitar amps and things like that, if you're unfamiliar. Um, but I'm going to, I use these to lock the input and output jacks down and connect to the body for a proper ground. So again, just like the switches, I'm going to leave one of these nuts against the body. Oh, actually, before I go any further, it's a lot easier at this point if I install the wire to the ground on the power let's see if I can zoom in on this part I'll try to keep zoomed in all right so I'm just gonna kind of do one of these it's a little tricky I'll show you what I do afterwards I just basically clip the lead after so I got the the wire going through the hole Solid mechanical connection, I guess. Tack it in place. Then I'm going to take our snips. Try not to go too hot or too long with your sawing iron because you don't want to break or, or melt that um, power connector. All right, so notice that's going to be separate. We're going to do the star grounding method where you go to a single common point 
on the jack to ground everything together. Um, for the nine volt, I'm gonna simply just grab using my pliers again and weave it into the input. And I like to tuck the wire down in this. It just kind of makes it clean. that cool all right so you're making sure that the nine volt isn't touching anything um all right tuck that all away we got here, we're gonna take the lock washer, this internal tooth, put that there. We're gonna have the wires, or sorry, the solder terminals at the top, just for ease of soldering. Put it through here. Put your nut and then the washer, of course. I don't know if you can hear it through my microphone, but it's starting to thunder outside. All right, so here's where I do use a nut driver because I like to crank down. And it's funny because I have people comment about my pedals that I build um, and, and sell, and they all say the same thing. Like, wow, for whatever reason, Connecting to your pedal feels so tight and robust and just solid. And I think it has a lot to just cranking down, you know, relatively on that jack and also that lock washer. You see a lot of builders not use that lock washer. Um, sometimes they don't on purpose. They try to... Um, have a ground isolations. So that means they don't want ground there. So they use like rubber, uh, sorry, not rubber, but they use like a fiber board or they use plastic jacks. And cranking down on plastic jacks is not good. Okay, so connecting to these is such, you kind of look at the wafer, the wafers here and you see the inner wafer, the wafer that's a little bit more on the outside, I guess. It's connecting to the uh, shield or the ground of the jack. So if I put a jack here, so tight. First time I use pro, uh, pure tone jacks, you can really feel how tight they can be um, because of the extra. See how there's two different contact points? But anyway, so I plug that in. And you can see that against the jacket or the shield, there's uh, that's how that's connected. And then the tip is connected to the wafer in here. Oops. That tip connection goes to the tip here. That's how you get your tip connected. Boom, like that. So I should have a wiring diagram by the time you watch this video. So check my build docs on thetonegeek.com. Definitely not my best work, uh, especially with a camera in front of my face.
but I can clean that up. So basically, I'm just going to take my needle nose pliers. What I like to do is, is again, you don't really want it pressing against the uh, the top plate here that goes over your pedal. But I, so I'm just going to have it um, push that down. Make sure it's not rising above where it's going to touch that top. And then the wire just kind of runs down the bottom channel here, trying to stay away from all the electronics, being close to the uh, metal or the aluminum enclosure for noise suppression, blah, 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 crosstalk, per, um, avoidance. All right, so now that's your output jack, your input jack. Obviously, it's on the same exact side, so we got to cross the wire up into over here. Looks good. Sometimes I get lucky. All right, so here's a little bit of a tricky part, what I like to do. Um, again, going with the star ground method. So all of these grounds are going to go to the same lug. And make sure your wire is not poking through and can touch the jack when it's being inserted. So make sure you tuck that around, pinch it if you have to. It might actually go in the front here, maybe. I can go over the top. All right, now we're going to use one more one more of these two and a quarter inch wires. We're just going to try to insert it in an open spot. All right, like that. All right. This, you know, this last one is kind of optional, but you'll see why. All right. So now we're going to just take that last wire and bridge it over to the other ground. Let's see. Now I know technically, since I'm using a star washer against the chassis or the, the pedal enclosure that is aluminum and conductive, that that should have its own conduct, uh, conductivity, thus connecting them together via ground and, and stuff like that. They have the same potential, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's okay. What I like to do is just add a wire. Because if for whatever reason, if, if, you know, there's too much powder coat or it's just not, something's not right there, or even through the uh, washer for whatever reason, um, it's got some homage, some resistance in there. It's not a, a clean, clean, clean connection, which is another reason why I really twist down on uh, using the nut driver. Uh, that could cause uh, some noise. So I like to just add that, and it doesn't make a ground loop. You hear about ground loops. It's so close, um, and that's not going to create a ground loop. So again, the ground is connected up to this point. The ground of the circuit board is all connected to this point. Uh, everything kind of comes back to this point here, uh, which is where the star ground method uh, comes from, I guess. And it should be a lot quieter. So now the next thing I got to do is find my 
op amp. Here it is. No, it's not. One second while I find my op amp. All right, here it is. TL072. Hopefully I got the right package. Comes in a lot of static proofing crud. Uh, basically because they're electrostatically sensitive. I should have a grounding strap attached to me. When I open this. All right, here's the op amp. Um, pretend like I have a grounding strap attached to me, so I'm not going to have any static electricity from me to the op amp, thus destroying it. Put that away. Uh, you'll notice that it's not easy to fit in here. Uh, there's a couple different methods. My personal favorite is find a surface very carefully press down on that surface so the legs all kind of move uniformly. One of these days I'll buy the actual tool. It's super cool, super fast. You basically zip one of these things through like a slide, like a water park slide, but it's, you know, for op amps and, well, not op amps specifically, but just ICs with these legs, these dip legs. And it's really fun. All right, so make sure before you push down that all the legs are in the holes. Sort of kind of align it and then push down. Make sure it's seated properly. When I push down, I feel the LED board kind of push out. That's okay. All right, so now it's just a simple matter of uh, if you want at this point, you try it out or have so much confidence that you're going to put the knobs on. I usually keep the knobs on for last. But I want to put them on now because I'm feeling good about this. So what I like to do is I like to turn my knobs all the way down, you know, roughly get that uh, whatever degree angle that is. And then tighten. And then twist your knobs to make sure they're not rubbing against the, the nut. I'm just using a flat head screwdriver here. Um, some of these knobs have uh, hex, otherwise known as Allen wrenches, but a lot of them also use these flatheads. So you can buy these screwdrivers from Tata or a bunch of other places sell them too. All right, here's my pedal. Let's plug it in and check it out. Give it, give it a test. So good news. Um... The pedal works. I'm super excited. It sounds great. There's a bunch of mess over here, but maybe we can peek at it. Yeah, there it is. Um, so there's my pedal. I'm using a Blues Breaker reissue uh, to kind of sort of test against. That's what I got right now. It's a reissue. And then I'm playing through my uh, Dumble Steel String Singer number four example here. And it sounds great. Sounds super clean, super clear. So I'm going to call this a success, and I'm going to make this uh, pedal widely available. Uh, not the, the pedal, but, you know, at least to do it yourself on my website, thetonegeek.com. So you can buy the, the circuit board and the faceplate. So uh, go ahead and go do that. But also, I made this project 100% completely open source and free. So you don't have to buy anything from me if you want. I'm just that nice of a guy. I just did this as a sort of educational lesson to, for folks to learn how to build their own PC, design their PCB uh, when it comes to guitar electronics. So I hope you've enjoyed this and subscribe if you wanted to see more 
let me know. Please, please, please drop me a line at thetonegeek.com. Thank you. And uh, I'll play a quick little thing. I'm not great, but, you know, 